Good lunch. Someone said to me, that was the best, and I thought he was about to say conference session I've ever been to, and he said lunch I've ever had at a conference. And then, you know, part of it is creating memory, so everyone will at least remember it was like good moose at the end and stuff, right? I, I didn't get any of that. Did everybody check out the story on Instagram? When you get a moment, take out your phones, you can go to uh, Instagram and go to the issue, issues Instagram, and you can check out that story live that we showed this morning. All right. So our next panel is going to join us in, uh, in a couple of minutes. And I think I mentioned this earlier this morning, and you know, when we were planning this second issue generator summit, this was the, the panel that we wanted to make sure was, uh, was part of it. We wanted to really make sure that we as an organization, we as a community, uh, are demonstrating really standing for freedom of the press. In this country, the First Amendment, but freedom of the press generally uh, around the globe. And we've got four people who are going to be joining us who, uh, in the last year in particular, have been at the forefront of really standing for what freedom of the press means, its impact on culture and society, and are really standing for, uh, for the future of what that's all about. We've seen their, uh, their voices manifest in March for Our Lives. We've seen their voices manifest in uh, moving, for, moving, moving forward following the shootings at Marjory Stoneman Douglas. Uh, we've seen their voices demonstrated in speaking up for what's happening around us every day and how, um, how truth can often be um, kind of put in the back burner in support of perception. So we're going to be joined by, um, by four people in particular, uh, Melissa Falkowski and Rebecca Schneid from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Melissa is the journalism teacher and English teacher there um, and a real inspiration to students in the school and, and to all of us in terms of um, particularly how she turned this event on February 14th at the school into a way for students to learn, engage, move forward, and share what's happening in the world um, and turn it into a journalistic uh, experience. She's joined by uh, Becca Schneid, who is the editor-in-chief of, um, of Marjorie Stoneman's uh, newspaper. And then um, we're also joined by uh, Lori Oglesby and, um, and Neha Madeira. And Lori was the uh, journalism advisor at Prosper High School um, and was actually let go uh, in a very controversial way last year in large part for defending and standing up for students' rights to write about what's really happening in their environment and in their school and uh, to stand up to the administration that was doing some pretty awful things. Uh, and Neha uh, spent her summer actually fighting for those rights and to be able to keep writing. She's now a senior and um, one in the, in the middle of Texas. Um, all of these people have, have been on uh, stages and are winning awards and uh, often we, we get caught up in the awards that they won or where they've spoken or um, what we're hearing from them. But these are four like, these are heroes to me and, um, and I hope we'll have a great session with them. Please join us. So, uh, you know, again, for the record, I just want to say uh, thank you for everything that you're doing, for the work you're doing, for the way that you're, both of you are, are leading students, and for uh, Rebecca and Neha, the way in which you're standing up uh, for what's happening in your world and what's happening in the world at large and, um, and speaking up for truth. It matters a lot. So, all right. So.
we'll just jump right in. How's that? So I'd love to, you know, what we're really focusing on here is the future of journalism, the future of freedom of the press, the future of the uh, First Amendment. And I'd love to hear from, uh, from our two students. Where, what do you see as sort of the greatest threats to the future of the freedom of the press? Um, I think that uh, the greatest, some of the greatest threats, I guess, to the future of the freedom of the press is, um, is this, this, I guess, misnomer for journalism today um, and, and the way in which I think um, our current administration um, and other people that believe in them believe that, uh, that the purpose of journalism is. But the truth is that I, I don't see journalists getting discouraged or becoming disenfranchised with, with you know, journalism as a whole. I, I, see, I see them getting empowered by it um, and deciding that it's, our, it's time to, obviously there are issues that need to be addressed in the journalism world. Um, and there are things that need to be changed. And I think that that's something that all journalists can likely um, say that it's true. But instead of becoming discouraged and, 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 and fighting, you know, backing down, we're fighting for our rights. And we're fighting to continue um, to have the right to, to have a seat at the table and have a say in what's going on and, um, and give other people the voices that, they, that, that we feel they deserve through journalism. I think another threat is, um, going back to the administrator's perspective, um, the relationship that student journalists have with administrators as well as with the public. Because, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not these relationships with them are good or bad. I mean, if they're bad, it shows, you know, why they care about um, the quality of their school over, um, over why they care about the image of their school over quality journalism. But if student journalists have a good relationship with their administrators, it shows how they trust that students can maintain a free press and you know, still write their responsible content without um, abridging their rights. So as teachers, what are you, um, how are you teaching about press freedoms, particularly, uh, particularly now given the current situation of, of the press in the United States? Um, how are you teaching about what freedom of the press means in journalism in general? How has that changed? Okay, sorry, please excuse my voice, but I lost it today, which is so inconvenient. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, I think, um, you know, the journalism teachers, at least, you know, through the network of, of teachers that, that I know, you know, we teach students the tenets of journalism, you know, we teach them what is ethical journalism, and we teach them that, you know, the goal above everything else is to tell the truth. Um, and so that's sort of like the starting point, you know, as far as my class is concerned, and whether you're um, writing a story about you know the baseball team, or whether you're delving into you know a deeper issue, is you know it being accurate, um, you know accuracy above everything else, getting it right, um, and telling the truth. And I think um, like that's the police, that's like the core of journalism, and that's like the core of what we teach um, the kids and, and the starting point. Um, and so I think that is what guides. I mean that's what guides. What that's what should guide journalism, and that's what guides you know, student journalism is that, you know, pursuit of truth. And I think if you teach them what is ethical and what is right and you have these conversations when tough stories and tough decisions have to be made and you teach them, you know, ethics, then they can, you can walk through them, you know, these sort of tough decisions that need to be made. And then they, I think 99% of the time I've seen students make the right decision um, when it comes to making a tough decision. In the classroom I had before, this year, <laughs> um, I had a poster on the wall that I made myself, and it said, the purpose of journalism is to have an informed electorate. Without journalism, democracy fails. And if we can't understand that, and if we don't instill that in our students, and so we have these silly things that change all the time in education, and right now the buzzword is essential question. And what was the le question answer you'd want? And all year long, my essential question was the same thing. What's the purpose of journalism? To have an informed electorate. And that goes back to the school to have informed students. Not so necessarily that they can vote for a 14-year-old, but so they can find their passions. So we have to have the information. It has to be a clear message. And we need to trust students and advisors to be able to present that. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, you know, we were kind of talking about this at lunch, but for some reason, for students, you know, adults sometimes want to shut them down because they're young, they're too young, they can't possibly know. But the, the thing about young people is that they have a voice. Like my seven-year-old son, he has a voice, and that voice is being cultivated as he grows. And so to discount them because they're young, 
there's never a better time for them to test their voice than when they're than when they're teenagers, when they're learning and they have, you know, an advisor or someone in front of them that can help sort of guide them through. But to say that they don't have a voice, like what is the as the question I always ask, what's the magic age where they're allowed to have a voice? Is it 18? Is it 21? Is it when they're 20? Like, when does that voice happen? And the aunt, truth is, is that you know, your voice starts very young and we have, it's our responsibility as a society to cultivate those voices because they're the future, like Lori says, they're the future of journalism, they're the future of our democracy, whether or not they become journalists. So it's wrong, I think, to discount them just because of their age. They have lots we to say. We champion programs that take students out of the classroom and let them shadow and work with healthcare workers. We love for the chefs to have the kids prepare in restaurants that are set up at the school. Um, we let them do all of these real-world activities, but when it comes to journalism, they want to stifle it and shut it down because they can't control the message. So how are you, the two of you, um, sharing your voice? How are you really going into topics that are, uh, that are relevant uh, to, to your community and, uh, and to the country? Well, going off what both of you know, these advisors said, um, they... We have to tackle these topics that are that are you know people people say that are too sensitive for students to be talking about because if we don't, um, a I mean it's we create change and so by reporting on issues that most people wouldn't want us to be talking about we're actually starting the conversation and creating a platform for other students at our school. <laughs> like what? Like what are some of the topics you've covered and some of the resistance you've faced? Well, we've attempted to cover a lot of topics, even though we've been censored a lot. Um, but, you know, topics like National Walkout Day, Me Too, things like that, um, and the LGBTQ community, um, by starting these conversations, we're allowing other students to express their opinions as well. That's definitely exactly what I, what I see my role as, as a journalist. And I've always said that there's, I, throughout my experience since February 14th, I've had the opportunity to be interviewed by people and uh, to interview people, and through that experience, which I never really um, had the opportunity to, to have before of, of being behind the cam or being in front of the camera and, and actually having um, being interviewed. And I think I've I realized the kind of journalist that I want to be, and the journalist that that um, that connects with their subjects and that raises other people's voices and that investigates um, a, a topic fully, and. And I think that the way that we've been doing that is, 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 is investigating important topics that I think that a lot of times the young voice has been ignored in. And um, in the Me Too movement, in, in, in the fight for LGBT rights, in the fight in, in Black Lives Matter, and in a lot of these movements, sometimes I see the young person's voice drowned out. And so what our job is as student journalists is to take that back to, to students so that they can, they can relate to it and that they can understand it from, from that perspective. And so, you know, last year before everything, we did, we did a piece on, on vaping. And that's actually a genuinely really important, like a really big issue at our school. And we, we did polls and like the teachers did not, un they didn't, they couldn't fathom that that many kids were vaping, let alone vaping at school, like in the, vaping, on, on vaping campus. Vaping in class. In, in in the, a fire classes. alarm went off just a couple weeks ago because a kid was vaping in, in um, in the in the bathrooms and and those and that's and that's I think that you know we see those commercials on on um, on TV about vaping but but we don't really see it taking back to the student perspective we don't see necessarily the Me Too and rape culture which is another piece that I did last year taken back to the student perspective um, and I think that that's something that we both try to do is to um, make everything that's going on in the world relevant to our lives, relevant to the students, so that they can then cultivate their own perspectives, cultivate their own views on it once we give them those facts. Yeah, and I would say that the difference between like our relationship with our administration, because we face censorship also in the past, they were not thrilled about the vaping. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you saw the vape nation, they were not happy about that. Um, but the difference is that we were able to have these conversations, like we have a really strong relationship. And even though there was one administrator who was saying, you know, well, we're gonna have to prior review your paper, you're gonna have to give it to us two weeks before you go to print. Um, and the kids pushed back really hard against that and then they went above that assistant principal, they went to the principal and he was very reasonable and we had this kind of conversation about like where can we kind of like meet in the middle where you're not reading everything that we're writing and we can kind of give you a heads up when something controversial is coming so that you can kind of like be prepared for it. And that's the difference like in, in terms of like a quality administrative relationship where they're open to having those conversations and they care 
that the students have a voice versus an administration that shuts them down altogether because they have to control the message of the school. And that was the main complaint. You know, they couldn't find anything wrong with the vaping story, the complaint was that it, it makes the school look bad. And I was like, okay, but in terms of like their press rights, you can't pull something from a, a, an issue because it makes the school look bad. If it's the truth, it's the truth. And so that's something, that's something administrators don't, don't seem to always understand. It's our so struggle. You, you've, had, you've had more success engaging the administration than yeah, on the other hand, you know, you we've, had, we've had administrators who've tried to shut us down, honestly, from the beginning. Our newspaper last year, it was really the second year that it started up, and we, from the beginning, have tried to cover issues, you know, not just the basic, oh, football won this game and lost this, but actually, like, important issues. And we've, we've had, you know, we face censorship and prior review and, like, all these things, but we've learned that that was just their way of trying to threaten us as student journalists to stop our controversial reporting because we were chasing these issues. And by speaking out, we've gained some freedom to you know, express uh, what we feel and have a platform, but at the same time, it's also out of fear because our administrators just want to drop the issue all in all. So how, how has your reporting changed, in the, particularly in the last, this school year as opposed to the last school year? And maybe you can actually just take a minute and, and share what happened uh, at the end of last year. Um, so last year we faced censorship and we uh, after we had three stories censored major stories and um, After the second one was censored we faced prior view and prior strain Tell them what the stories which, were about. So the first story was um, a new story on the cancellation of a senior movie day tradition after um, a cancer fundraiser The second story was an editorial on the removal of a separate piece because it had gay undertones um, and our third story was about, it was an editorial on National Walkout Day. We had a failed team bonding activity, and our principal wrote a newsletter right after the activity saying that it went really well, and it was a moment of solidarity among the student body. And so all of, in all of these cases, we were just telling the truth. And in the editorials, we were expressing our opinions, but each time our principal censored us because he I, didn't agree with us or he didn't like how we were portraying the school. And he also did things like prior view and prior restraint, which means that administrators, they demand to read articles before they're published or they inhibit articles from being published um, after they read it. And they also fired our former advisor, Ms. Oglesby. So after all of that, it was just steps for them to try to see what they could do in order to make sure we stopped, um, we, we dropped our controversial investigative reporting. And what have, how have you changed your reporting this year? Um, well, we... Our assistant editor now, Haley, we, we spoke out at the end of last year and we worked with the Student Press Law Center. We're still working with them. Um, and after speaking out, our schools definitely kind of backed down just because they're scared. But at the same time, in working on a relationship with them, that hasn't really changed at all. This year, we haven't even talked to our principal. Um, and, you know, they've hired a new advisor who um, is now kind of the messenger between administrators and our staff. So we talk to our advisor if we have a problem with an administrator. And so they're finding new ways of censorship and that's why the fight for student press rights is so important because we've definitely you know, caused a ripple, um, but we haven't made, none of that from the administrator's perspective has actually changed. So we've definitely, um, we've aimed at reporting the truth no matter what and we still did last year as well, but we also have to be careful to not um, self-censor, because that's really easy when they want to shut you down. So the self-censorship starts. Do you find that as well, mm. Becca? And well, last year when we had the, the, this was before everything, it was in about January, I think, when our, our Rape Nation um, piece came out. And I remember you, we, we ha immediately had a meeting with the, the, the assistant principal, and then we met with our principal, me and my co-editors-in-chief. Um, and... I think that we do have a problem with self-censorship. We do sometimes have a problem with, but we, you, my advisor, Ms. Falkowski, she wanted us to fight for, um, for our right to speak, and we, we were just as adamant that we, des that we had the right to talk about this. Um, and it was interesting, because it was like the teachers were really, they were upset about it. They were upset that, that we were talking about vaping, and we were like, wh why wouldn't you want us to talk about this problem that's happening at school? That's our job. That's what our job is as, as student journalists is to talk about issues that are going on at school. And and honestly, I'm surprised we didn't talk about it beforehand because it's it like I think it was like 30 percent of our of our um, of our respondents to our poll said they were vaping. And if that's not an issue at school, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, and and but we we work really hard to make sure that we can keep that relationship with our principal. And we're really lucky that we have that relationship. But we also want to make sure that that 
we're not getting um, strong armed and we're not like we're not they're, they're not censoring us for something that that is our job. I mean, I would definitely say the students, they do self-censor, because like last year, there was a student, she wanted to do this like investigative report about the bathrooms, and she's like, I don't think I can do it because I think administration will get mad. And so my, I said, you can do it, you just have to tell their side of the story, like what are they saying, because the students are saying, oh, the bathrooms are disgusting, and the administration's doing nothing about it, and the issue is actually really more complicated than that, because they're outdoor bathrooms, and they're not, you know, there's no air conditioning, like it was actually much more complicated. Um, and so she did this like really great, like ex it's disgusting, she did this really great expose <laughs> with like all these pictures of like all these horrible things that happened in the bathroom. Um, but, you know, and afterwards though, but afterwards administration, they said like that they, that they thought the story was good because they thought it was fair. Like they thought that the outcome of the story was fair, but they have the tendency to do that because they're afraid, like even last week, because there was a lot of controversy at our school after they like removed a bunch of administrators, they had quotes from our principal and they weren't sure whether or not they should use them because they were afraid they were gonna get him in trouble. So like, they, there is always that, because they're students and they're, you know, uh, am I gonna get a detention? Am I gonna get a referral? Am I gonna get in trouble? So that, that runs that runs through, but I mean, they're the ones that come up with this stuff. Like a student already proposed they want to do like a story this year about underage drinking. And I was like, oh great, here we go here we again. Go. <laughs> you know? Attach it to the vaping one, right? So when I, I, I wrote for my high school newspaper and um, it, was, it sort of looked like this. It was a stapled together uh, <laughs> set of pages and I don't know, certainly no one, most people in the school didn't even know we had a school newspaper and it certainly didn't get uh, very widely distributed or read. And I'm wondering, in this day and age with this massive digital distribution, um, how, how is the digital world changing what you're writing and how, how you're teaching, and then how you, how you're, what you're writing and how what you're writing is being seen and perceived around the world in a lot of cases? Well, we, have, um, we don't have a print newspaper. We have an online newspaper. But um, even, that, even with that, students aren't going to go out and the community members aren't, aren't going to be like, oh, eaglenationonline.com, what's happening today? You know? And so we have to find new ways to um, present this information to our student body and to our community. And so using social media is definitely a way to do that because you can slide up or click a link to go directly to a story that they want to see. And then um, being able to see analytics as well to what um, our readership want to, you know, the percentage of what they're reading per day and reporting based on that, that definitely helps. Yeah, and we, um, I think that, yeah, we have a print, we have a quarterly print come out and we also have an, uh, an online website. But something else that we do is we have a, an Instagram account called Humans of MSD. So it's, a, it's like a take on Humans of New York. And that has like, I, we just looked at it, I just looked at it earlier, it has like 11,000 followers now after, um, uh, and it's, it's pretty popular. And so we always try to, to talk about people's stories on there. But, but also I think that um, like you just said, online and then, you know, you can swipe up, you can, there's so many new ways. And like we were just talking about this because we were, well, we, we just texted our, our multimedia uh, editor and we were like, we wish you were here with us. We this that's like cool things that we're, we, we're excited for you to do because um, our kids, even more so than adults, they're not maybe even more so, but just as much as adults, kids are on their phones all the time. More so. More, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, they're on they're on their phones all the time, in school, out of school. So the moment that you give them, and the moment that you give them something that they can just swipe up on, the less clicking that they have to do, the better. So if you just have, you know, an Instagram story where they just swipe up and it has um, has all the information that they want about, you know, school walkout or 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 anything like that the better. So it's, I think that that's such an interesting way for us as student journalists to prepare for our lives as journalists because this is the way that journalism is going. It's, it's moving towards a digital, uh, we, we're in a digital age. And so the, we need to take advantage of the tools that we have in front of us so that we can, you know, we can maximize the amount of people that we reach in our school um, and maximize the amount of impact that we can have in our school. You write for, do you write for beyond the school community itself? Now we do. Now we do. I mean, yeah. before, or like, we, you know, we were just doing our thing, right? Like telling the, the news of the school. And then, you know, obviously what happened happened. And then, like, we had this global audience, which was, in, you know, insane. And so then you kind of are. But we try, I think, really hard to keep it, like, true to the school. Like, Grounded. ultimately, our responsibility in our community is our school. And it's amazing that people want to read our newspaper from everywhere. But um, at the end of the day, like, our responsibility is the school. Um, but we face the same things like you guys were talking about this morning, like where to tell the story, like do we tell it on social media, do we tell it on our online, do we tell it in our print, like should we be adding multimedia to our print, like on issue, like so some of the things that we've been talking about doing, like 
those same conversations when we go to these um, national journalism conferences, like the student journalists are talking about the same things that you guys are. How do we drive our students like to our website and to read our content and to pick up our newspaper and our yearbooks and all these things? These are the same conversations that are being had um, by student journalists. They face the, the same issues. Um, attention span and you know no one's going to our website like we tweet the links the reporters tweet their links and and so we can get drive traffic there um, well yeah as a newer newspaper we try to target all of our stories more you know to our school and what they want to see but then once you know we spoke out and our, our story hit a national platform we realized how many other students and advisors um, were impacted by what we were doing and so us collaborating I guess on stories and covering things that not just people you know, in Prosper, Texas want to read, it's really important for everyone to be able to access that because it's just one more accurate story and accurate platform for students to talk about. So I'm, I'm curious, um, all four of you have, have in one way or another in the last uh, few months in particular been on the national stage and connected with lots of other student journalism programs, student journalists. What's the environment? What's the student journalism environment like in the United States? What are you um, learning, what are you seeing? Well, I've been on the board of National Journalism Organization, and I do work in schools sometimes. So I get to go to a lot of different campuses, and I think that the, the, the biggest problem is the self-censoring, students not understanding that they can do something, and not feeling empowered to do that. And I think that is the draw of social media, the draw of a, a digital platform, that it doesn't take a class to be able to accomplish that. And so that lesson still is out there. And I think what we, you know, I love the STEM and how it's brought all that to, but I think we need to add another M to STEM and make it media. Media literacy and media um, create, creation. And so I don't under, think they understand their voices totally, but I do think that there's some phenomenal programs out there that would be, it would shock how really well they're run but I think there's so much more that can be done. Yeah, I mean, I would say <clears throat> that, you know, um, California like has some of the best student journalism in the nation because they are prote their student journalists are protected by state law, so they can't be censored, and their advisors are protected from being fired um, for what their students produce. So always, like when I was um, advising your book, like all the best your books always came out of California, all the best student newspapers. And Texas. And, yes, Texas has good <laughs> stuff too, that's true. But um, I think it just, the health of student journalism, I think, is just dependent, like, it, it varies from state to state, and it varies from district to district, and it depends on whether or not they're placing a value on it, and whether or not, like, student voices are being cultivated, and there are some places where student voices are being squashed, and so, like, um, you know, there's, or there's a student press law center, which is, like, this amazing um, organization that helps students in high school and college fight censorship, and they're trying to go state by state, and so far they've I think done 13 states where they've passed this new voices law in the state legislators, uh, legislatures so that they can give the students um, more rights in, in those states. And of course, like uh, Florida will probably be the absolute last to have that. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's our, and then like the district right to the south of us, uh, Miami-Dade, in their student code of conduct forbids administrators from censoring any student media in their county. So one county away, they have total, you know, freedom of the press and then where we are not, you know, it says that they, the administration has the final, gets to have the final say. And so, you know, it's the health of it really, but in the places where it's being cultivated, it is, it's thriving and they're producing amazing stuff. There was some school in Kansas, I think, that somehow figured out that the person they were hiring to be a replacement principal didn't have like actually the credentials to be a principal. And they did this investigative story and then the district ended up like firing that person and going out and finding a real principal. I mean like, that like yeah. doesn't get any like it doesn't get any better than that. Like student journalists can do the same job as professional journalists. They just need they just need to be encouraged and they need training and that's it. And actually Kansas has many great programs yeah. and they have the protection as well. And I think that also talking about like the 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 um, the climate of student journalists, you see that we're we're, talk we're calling ourselves student journalists mm -hmm. because although I consider myself a journalist, I think I'm, I am a journalist. I'm also 17 years old, and I'm also a student. Um, and I think that you making that distinction is important because this happens to no matter what kind of um, you no matter what kind of career you're preparing for, you have a voice, whether you're a journalist or something or, or somebody else. And I think that just now in America, 
kids, students, people of my age, whether they're 14, 15, 16, 17, are starting to realize that they do have a voice, that they have, that they have an opportunity to use that voice, like Ms. Falkowski said, whether or not um, society says that, that, that they're old enough, that, um, that, that you're, if you are a, a participant in society and, you, and you're experiencing things, then you have a right to voice those opinions. You have to a right to voice your opinions on what things are happening to you. Um, and I think that that's true to every single kid in America, just as it's true to student journalists. And, and, and the, the question and the problem that we face is making sure that they feel empowered. And not, not that we give them the voice, but that we make sure that they understand that they already have it. They already have the ability to write about things that they feel passionate about. They already have the ability to investigate things like that, that they have the power to, 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 change, um, to change what's going on in their school and to, and to change the, the, the culture at, our, at their school. And if they don't like something, that they can investigate that and then they can, they can expose it to, and then maybe people at their school will be like, oh, that does make sense. We should, we should talk about this. We can start a conversation. And I think that because of the work of other students, whether they be journalists or not, student journalists today, the, the, I would say that the major climate is like, they feel empowered. They're starting to feel empowered and feel this energy and this galvanization of, um, of young people that we haven't really seen before. Um, or, I mean, I, I think we have, but we haven't recently. And, and that galvanization is so powerful um, in student journalism and in just student voices in general. Are you, me <clears throat> are you meeting other people around the country that are inspiring you and that you're oh. learning from? Oh my God, all yes, the time. All, all the time. The, the, I actually just had to write a college essay on what inspires me, and the immediate response was my peers, people like people my age that are doing amazing things in student journalism and um, in society in general because, because, like I said, they're starting to find their voice, and, and they're the most inspiring people, more inspiring than I think anybody. Like they're just, they're just amazing, and, and, I, and I love interacting with them. Yeah, when you when you fought um, your principal essentially over the summer, did you hesitate? Did you think I better not do this? I think closer to the beginning, yes, yeah. just because we didn't really. When we first spoke out, we thought that our story was going to last about a week, and then you know our principals, our principals, our administrators would either say, "Okay, you're gonna, we're going to change the policy," or they just would you know uh, sweep it under the rug. But it it turned into this national story, and it it. it it also helped um, me find the new voices legislation and fight for that in my state. And the story just kept getting bigger and bigger. And we started reaching more students and more advisors who felt impacted because, you know, in our state, in Texas, it's an at-will state. So teachers have probationary contracts so they can get fired all the time um, without really a clear reason. So we weren't only impacting students, but we were also fighting for our teachers' rights. And we were fighting for everyone's rights. So you both are on your way to college next year. This is it for high school. Yeah. <laughs> You're both going to study journalism. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> are you hopeful about the future of journalism? Or are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic? Um, I'm super hopeful about because I've been to enough of of these kinds of things where I see that we're working towards solutions to the problems that, that face journalists every day, that there is a momentum that is being carried. It's not like we're staying stagnant and we're just like, all right, we're done. Like, it's like, like there's, there's a, a, a um, there is a, you know, there's momentum for journalists of all ages. And, and, I, and I can see that like journalists that are older are taking us in and, and, and wanting us to be the change. They're not, they're not rejecting us. They're not saying that we don't have a voice. They want us to be, they want our opinions. They want our, our voice because they realize that we are the future of journalism and that what we do now is going to impact the future of journalism. And because I see that, I'm super hopeful that, that obviously, just like anything in America, it's not gonna take one day. Just like anything anywhere, it's not gonna take one day. It's not gonna take one week. The culture around journalism, you know, the most, like we said, the most media, there is the most media consumption in America, but also some, some of the least, like the, there's not a lot of trust in the media nowadays, which is a really terrible thing because, because we try to work towards democracy. We like try to work towards the people. So if the people don't believe us, then, that, then there's obviously a disconnect, like um, uh, there's, there's not a connection there that we need to work on. Um, and so that's not gonna get, like I said, there's not, that's not gonna be fixed in one day. But I'm really hopeful that eventually with the work of of young people like us and experienced journalists, 
we're going to be able to find that connection and, and, and make a change that's going to change the culture of journalism in America. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely optimistic, but we also have to realize as student journalists that, and journalists in general that it's, it's going to be a fight, you know, especially with our story. Our administration, they did overturn their policy, but like I mentioned earlier, we still face issues, and so do a lot of other schools around the country. And we honestly feel like we got lucky, and we have to keep fighting for not only our rights, but other students' rights, because what I think our staff has learned um, in the last two years is that we have, no matter what we do, we kind of have to keep proving ourselves to our administrators, which is ridiculous, just because you know we need to have a trustworthy relationship with not only the public, and for them to know that we are gonna report the truth no matter what, um, and but also with our administrators. And so it doesn't matter if you're in high school or in college, you're still going to have to fight. And I mean, or it even after happen. college, right? Yeah. yeah. I think part of the disconnect is that um, we're not really teaching media literacy in school. Like, students need media literacy because the, the landscape has changed. Like, when I was graduating from high school, like, none of this stuff existed. There was no texting. Like, there was none of this stuff. And they don't under, people don't always understand, like, the media in front of them and, like, what they're consuming. And so they have a hard time telling the difference between some, like, talking head on TV versus, like, what is an objective news report. And I think that has to start, like, the education of that has to start, you know, in in elementary school, like, what am I looking at? Is this, because you know, that's something my son is learning. What is, you know, objective and, like, what what is, a, you know, an opinion? What is a fact? Um, and so that's part of the disconnect, I think, is that, you know, we've moved towards all this political commentary and all these talking heads on TV, and, and people don't understand what it is that they're consuming. Even when we label things sometimes, like, editorial, like, in the newspaper, people don't understand that they're consuming that individual student's opinion or our editorial board's opinion. And so that's part of, I think, the disconnect between, um, you know, the distrust of the media is people don't always understand what exactly it is that they're, um, that they're looking at. But there's no doubt, like, we need journalism. America needs journalism um, because there, who else is going to tell us when the government is doing something that is corrupt? Like, we can't understand the things that are happening around us in society or understand, um, you know, our neighbors and who they are and, and those stories that need to be told if we don't have journalists. And so I think there's a need for it. It's just a question of whether or not people can understand what it is that they're viewing. It is the First Amendment. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious your reaction. You know, we're in a world where we have alternative facts and fake news and press uh, the enemy of the people and all of this... Uh, designed to create confusion or who knows what. Um, how do we win journalism back? How do we fight against alternative facts, fight against fake news? How do we establish journalism as uh, that important voice of the people? When our staff first started talking to the Student Press Law Center, we one of the biggest thing one of the biggest things they told us was that how journalism is a respectable prof profession, but you're going to have to prove to the people why it is and why the decisions you're making are important, and not just that you have the right to make them. And I feel like um, whenever you you establish transparency and you establish an editorial board policy where you're telling the people this is what we're writing, we're writing every story to inform, to educate, or to entertain the people, and they have that relationship with us that's really strong. And I keep saying that just because it's so important. Because you know, when the people trust us and when we can trust our administrators and our readership, we know that we're all on the same page because that's where a lot of the miscommunication happens. Totally. And also for me, when I was saying um, I've had I've been interviewed by like I remember in the beginning of this in the first couple weeks after February 14th I was like I do not want to be a journalist anymore oh my god they like because because I remember at the vigil the next day there was like somebody with like a camera in my face as I was crying and like stuff like that but 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 and those are the kind that's the kind of journalist that I don't want to be and that's what I, what I said I, I had I had figured out what kind of journalist I want to be and it was the one the ones that created a relationship with me that, that wanted to know my opinions and that were that were really genuine and created a relationship with their subjects to thus create a relationship with their viewers or with their audience which transcends through the page you know when you when you have a, um, a story that's going to connect with people you know, or versus a story that's kind of that that's not relevant and that falls flat and that doesn't really do anything and 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 that distinction was really important for me into, in, into making sure that all the stories that I write, don't just connect with what like they connect with everybody. They they that they that they transcend through the page the emotion the of of my subjects, um, the the of the people that I'm interviewing and the 
exactly like the intention of what they're saying, that that, that comes through through my words and my interpretation of, of, of what's going on and my objective facts and stuff like that. And I think that that's, that, that's the way that we're gonna combat the um, fake news, which was a thing before Donald Trump said it, and like, and and all of that stuff. That's the way that we're going to combat it is is by is by making sure that we remain objective and that we um, remain the best journalist that we can be. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, we talk about like objectivity and stuff, but I'm not sure you can always necessarily be 100% objective um, because we all come from like our backgrounds and that influences us. And I think like you know, what you were saying about transparency. But I think our goal has to always, you know, be truth and accuracy and transparency. And I think I love, like, the real-time fact-checking that they do. Like, um, I think that's so important that the press has started to do that. Like, these are all the lies. These are all the things that are not true. And then explaining why it's not true, I think that's something um, that has to continue so that people can, you know, kind of differentiate between, you know, whatever everyone is saying is fake news or whatever. Lori, how have you seen the curriculum change given the current environment? Well, I taught for 35 years. I know I don't look it. And um, <laughs> I don't. Um, over those 35 years, I operated under the Tinker standard, which is students do not shed their rights at the schoolhouse gate. And one of the finest moments of this whole war was when Mary Beth Tinker reached out to my staff and me and we've actually have a dialogue going with her on a constant basis. Um, it went to the Kuhlmeyer uh, case, which ended up being the Hazelwood case because the school district won, and that gave administrators more rights in censoring if it had pedagogical concerns. So I was fortunate enough to be in a state that passed this legislation, and that was Arkansas, of all places, passed legislation protected. But if you're noticing the news this week, there's a story about a high school writer and an advisor in trouble in Springdale, Arkansas, uh, for writing about the football team losing. In, in, end of story. That's the controversy of the team. So I actually see that the, you know. I, when do they I, write about vaping? So if we were coming off a high of the Woodward Bernstein era, you know, whenever I, you know, uh, I graduated in 80, and um, then I went into college, and I still felt that power. But then it kind of shut down in 89, but then we really rallied to work to find student voice. But it seems like in the last couple of years that with this anta antagonism toward the media, that it's hard to find support in our neighbor in, in the community that Neha lives in. We are not allowed. She's not allowed. I, obviously, I'm not. She's not allowed to mention this, tweet about this, on any of the school accounts that the student media has. This meeting, this conference. This conference. Last week, she did a TED Talk in California for the TED women. Not allowed to mention it, tweet about it, or talk about it because it will make the school look bad. And if we don't understand, if something is bad in the school, not talking about it won't change it. And these kids are on the front line of making sure that we understand what the conversation should be. Not those of us who graduated in 1980, not those of us who go to the teacher's workroom and aren't in the rooms where they're vaping, although I did see a teacher vape. <laughs> so, we'll write a story about that next yeah, issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if we're going to, it, it goes with the ebb and flow of the world that we all live in. And right now, being a journalist is not a very popular thing. If I tell people, you know, they ask me what grade I teach, if I say I teach, and when I say high school, they look at me like I microwave kittens for a living. <laughs> um, and then when I say journalism, they immediately turn to disdain, like, ugh, why would you do, isn't that dead? And you're like, no, it's not, because when it dies, democracy dies. So I think that the same field that we've seen People think it's dying. It's not. It's taking a different form. I always tell the kids if they're making the adults in the room uncomfortable, then they're probably doing the right <laughs> thing. <laughs> Rebecca, you, uh, you went through a horrific experience in your school, and, and um, out of it came some pretty amazing journalism and, and, um, and content that you created. I'm, I'm curious how you approached that experience from a well, journalism with, perspective. I mean, I was with Falkowski um, that day. Um, 
and um, we were we were hiding in the closet together, and immediately, I mean, we didn't. It was important to know is that we had no idea what was going on. We had absolutely no clue what was going on. And I remember the first thing, one of the things you said, she's like, "Well, we're going to need to scrap the second issue, the third issue. We're going to whatever because whatever was going on was going to be a story. We knew that it was going to be a story. So, and we were in journal, we were in newspaper class, so we we recognized that. And I remember that night, I um, after obviously I found we we realized what was going on, and we were evacuated by the SWAT team. Um, and I went home and I was watching the news because what else can you do? There's literally nothing else that you can do. Um, and I text, but I texted Falkowski and I said, well, first I said, thank you for keeping me safe. Um, and second of all, we're going to use the newspaper to fight for the people that we lost. And I like to think that we did that um, because immediately we knew that, I mean, there was a galvanization of kids at our school and kids around the country and that was so important and we knew that we wanted to, to talk about that. We went to the March for Our Lives and we, and we did all that, but before we did that, we, it was, we knew we lost 17 people, um, 17 people at our school. And that was devastating. And we needed to have closure there before we talked about um, um, activism and all of those things, which we did end up doing. And but um, and we did that online. But so for our, our third quarter, we scrapped our third quarter issue, put whatever stories that were done online, and we created the memorial issue, which was a it, they were it was seventeen uh, obituaries, I guess, or, or stories of the seventeen people that we lost, and each of us took a story, like our best writers and our most committed writers, whoever was ready to take that on, she made that clear to us. If you're not ready, you don't have to, you, you don't have no obligation. And, um, and we wrote about like 1,500 words for each person about their lives, talked nothing about February 14th, about their lives, who they were, um, what they liked to eat, <laughs> um, what they liked to do in their free time, their girlfriends, their boyfriends. Um, and, I, and the response to that was, some of the most that was the most touching thing I've ever experienced, and it's probably it's definitely most definitely the thing that I'm most proud of that I've ever produced as a journalist because um, the lives that we touched was it was um, it was the hardest experience I've ever been through was coming into school for the next month and having to relive that day over and over again and and remember what happened and I like couldn't escape it but the end product was. Um, is the thing that I think I'm most proud of that I've ever produced. Yeah, every every student in our school left school that day with it, with the issue. Like when people were leaving, I mean, they had clear backpacks, which some of you might have heard of. But as they left, like everyone's clear backpack had an issue. You know, had the memorial issue of the eagle eye, and so that was like a really powerful thing. And it was seen, you know, like across the world, and um, it was republished by the Washington Post and. Um, and it was really important in that like initial first issue that we did, like not to be um, political or whatever. We, we were doing that already online, and we were doing it all, everywhere else. But that issue was like kind of like sacred to yeah. us, and it needed to be about like remembering people. And then when we did our last issue, um, then it became really important to us because a lot of people think there's 3,300 kids at our school, and everyone seems to think that everyone at our school is March for Our Lives. Like they think we're March for Our Lives. Everyone's March for Our Lives, but like. That's not, I mean, that's not accurate. Um, so it was very important to the students that they show other voices. So we did, the first time ever, we invited guest editorials from students who were not on newspaper staff to write about you know, different aspects of activism and gun violence, and even some people that, um, alumni, and also um, some people that don't even go to our school just to get like diverse voices and opinions. Yeah. And that was, I think, really um, successful, and it was very important to them, because they said people aren't gonna take us seriously or think we're legitimate if we're only gonna say this one perspective, we're not gonna share any other perspectives. And I yeah. thought that was like, that's very, how insightful is that for like 17, 18 year olds to say, we need other, other voices besides our own. Um, and so that was probably one of the most successful things we did in last year in, in the last issue. And something that we recognized was also that um, that uh, Stoneman Douglas is not it's not the most diverse place. We're not in an inner city school, and and the majority of gun violence doesn't happen in school shootings. It happens in the inner cities. It happens from domestic violence. It happens from gang violence. So we invited a, like the, what she was talking about. We invited a guest editor from an inner city school to come and talk. We invited we we wanted to make sure that I mean. Uh, there were there were a bunch of us actually in the paper that were involved in March for Our Lives right. that that and um, and we recognized that we couldn't possibly be um, be taken seriously if we're writing only us mm -hmm. um, and and we all, we had we had a, an Eagle Eye manifesto in there which was our own take on what we thought needed to happen in the country so how can we be taken seriously if if we if you know we ourselves were involved in it so that's why we we involved as many <coughs> as possible and. 
we wanted to make sure that, that everybody at our school, and also something that we said, we said everybody, anybody who has a perspective to say, anybody that was there that day can come into the newspaper room and talk to us and tell their story. Because I know there were some people that felt like they weren't being listened to, and we wanted everyone to know that they had a shot, they had a, 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 an opportunity to come and talk to us and tell their story, and we would listen. We would, we would listen to them, and we would share their story. Um, and I'm, I'm super proud of that, of the, the way that we did that. We'll take questions in a minute, but uh, anyhow, when you're, you're leaving, I'm curious how you're thinking about the future of the newspaper in, in your high school. <clears throat> um, at our high school, I think that it's always going to be challenging in schools where administrators don't trust student journalists. Like sometimes that just never changes and sometimes it does. And sometimes there are legislations passed like new voices that can help support that. But we just have to do the best we can to make sure our student journalists feel respected and feel that they can voice their opinions without being shut down since that's something that you know, we've had a new, we have had a lot more staff members this year. We have a ton of new staff members who wanted to join because they heard about what happened last year and they wanted to fight the good fight. But then we have so many journalists on our staff who feel like they can't voice their opinions sometimes because of everything that happened and they don't want to cause any more problems. But that's not what we need to be teaching them. We need to be teaching them that they can make a difference and that standing up and speaking out for what you believe in, it's important. And nothing is going to change if you don't do that. So um, I, I think that I trust our staff more than anything else. And Jackie Pizer, we owe so much to her from the New York Times. She's the one who gave our story the lift for the national coverage and giving Neha such a voice and Haley to do this and to speak out and let people understand this issue. Awesome. Thank you. So we'll take questions. And um, the only rule we have related to questions is if you have a follow-up, hold on to the mic. That was a joke that fell flat. <laughs> <coughs> Well, in terms of our school district specifically and school districts surrounding us, we have a local policy and a legal policy. In our local policy, it states that it doesn't matter if it's a digital platform or an online platform, if it's a school-sponsored publication, so a student newspaper or a student broadcast or whatever, it still it, it applies to the same law, that they have the right to say that we can't write what they don't like, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, there are some um, schools that face censorship and then they, they go like, because um, if you have like an totally underground like student newspaper that's like not associated with the school, then they have like full, you know, freedom of the press or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, that kind of, uh, the, whoever starts that, right, and then it lacks continuity because, like, our our staffs they turn over every three to four years. So, like, the the continuity is like the advisor a lot of times, and then the knowledge that's being passed down from student editors to the next editor. So, um, in taking your paper kind of like off campus, I think you lose that um, continuity, and then after a couple of years, you'd see that paper kind of like. Um, you know, kind of pitter out. And I think it's important for students to have the support of like a quality journalism advisor um, because that is, those are the ways that they're going to get, you know, lessons about journalism ethics and those are the people who are going to challenge them and say like this article is not balanced and you haven't thought about this. And um, so I think um, you kind of, you want it to be education based and not just like a free for all, everyone just gets to write whatever, you know. And, so. also and the, re oh, I'm sorry. You can go. the repercussions for the students are very real, even though it may be off campus, they withhold letters of recommendation, they get them other ways. And so to take it off campus is a way to get the voice out. But, you know, these girls, we had several parents who would not allow their students to stand. And Neha and Haley's parents were the only ones that allowed them to speak to the media and to present this case because there was a great fear of what would happen to them. And it's still a great fear. I think that she's going to get to any college she wants to go to. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and scholarships are welcome. Um, <laughs> but if she, <laughs> if she, it, it's the fear. 
is the fear. Well, I, th I think there's something, though, in saying, like, right is right and wrong is wrong. Like, they shouldn't have to take their paper off campus because it's not right for um, their voices to be discounted. So I think in, in one aspect, it's like, that's, that's like running away from the fight. And I think you have to say, like, no, this is, like, you know, March for Our Lives said, no, this is wrong. Like, you're saying, no, this is wrong. You can't do this. And that, I think that's an important lesson for students to learn, too, like, if something is wrong, they have to be able to say and it's wrong. several media outlets out ran anything that the school would censor. Um, so that was awesome. The Prosper Press, which took a big stand and ran the stories in their full, and several schools across the country did, and the Student Press Law Center did as well, which they did for the school in Springdale. So if you want to read about how horrible their football team was this year, <laughs> you can. Becca, you, or, Nate, Nate, you had something you wanted to Sorry, mm -mm. going back to your question, the digital platform, the Student Press Law Center, they have a list of what student journalists should do when they're censored or how, it, how advisors should handle it. And one of their things to make a statement is to actually take your stories that have been censored, start a new website and publish them there just for the public to see. And there was actually a situation in Utah where two kids were censored. Um, it was that Harriman Telegram at their school and they started their own newspaper, The Telegraph. And it didn't change the censorship at their school, but that, what they did, you know, it made a national story. It was, they had this huge platform just because it's a statement to say, you know, you can't silence us and we have other ways to get our, to get our stories out because technology is available to, you know, everyone in the U.S. for the most part and so. I will say though for me, I mean, the reason why I, I didn't, I, I never thought that I would want to be a journalist coming into high school. Um, I didn't, I didn't even take journalism in my first year. I took like debate or something like that, I think. <laughs> but, um, and, and the reason why I realized that I want to be a journalist was my experience with my advisor, Ms. Falkowski, and my experience with my, with my, um, my staff, and my experience in the classroom and in the, the bond that we all cultivated for journalism and, and our love for it. And I don't think I would have had that same experience or even realized my passion for journalism if I, didn't, if I wasn't in a classroom with, with that kind of support um, and with yeah, the support of Ms. Falkowski and of, and of my peers and stuff like that. So if I, I think that there is a danger of, of students not having that, that support system and not having that backbone. So I, th I think that you could, we could technically go um, you know, to another website and, and, and do that. But that, that core still needs to be there if we want to cultivate good journalists. There still needs to be a, a classroom. There still needs to be um, teaching, like, some, like, like a, a reliable advisor and a reliable staff that's going to support you because that's the whole reason why I'm, I'm even here. Other questions? First off, uh, Joe and Ishii, thank you for this topic. This is really, really amazing. Um, I just wonder, I, this might be a really hard question, but have you been facing any kind of intimidation or threats either from students or other parents or people in the community? And you've kind of alluded to it, but I, 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 I'm curious. All the time. I mean, like over the summer, we would get hate messages. All like I, I don't want to say daily because that's not accurate, but like several days out of the week, you know. And it's just you. You're always going to get that from people who don't understand the value of a free press and who don't understand why student journalism is so important. Because most of the time, you know, whenever we first spoke out, people at our own school were just kind of like, "Why are you talking about this? You know, you're just making our school look bad. You're complaining. You're whining." And then when you know a lot, when everyone understood how there's a national legislation, you know, to support student journalists and how big this issue is and how by censoring students, you're, you're teaching them to censor themselves when they're adults, you know, and then whenever everyone realized that, it did die down, um, you know, but it's still, it's, it's always going to be there and we just have to realize why we're here in the first place. Like Becca said, you know, what, why are we fighting? I think, I mean... We've definitely received all, all I mean, oh, it's yeah, the no connection. One, we had a lot of um, uh, negativity, like, after they published their, um, well, I mean, we were working with The Guardian, and they titled it the the manifesto, so, like, that didn't win any love from, <laughs> from conservatives, I don't think. Um, <laughs> but then we just kind of embraced it, and we reprinted it with the same name because we were like, all right, whatever. Um, but, I mean... They definitely got a lot of. Um, we got a lot. Of we got, yeah. and even um, like we get comments on our stories and stuff. And there were comments I had to delete because they were just, they were really hateful. Um, and I think the kids did a really good job yeah. of like taking that in stride. But 
um, yeah, they, a lot of, there are a lot of people out there that were not happy with their take on gun violence and how to solve yeah. it, and so they, they dealt with a lot of negativity. I, also, I mean, first of all, the connection to the school inherently brings in a lot of hate. Um, I don't know why, but I guess it does. Um, and also, I did a bunch of like press interviews. I did like <laughs> um, I do I did a bunch of press interviews on like I did one on CNN where I talked about um, I talked about the about journalism and in the in journalism on, I was on reliable sources or whatever and and I talked about that and oh my god the the yeah. amount of of hate that I got yeah. for that was it was it, and it's kind of CNN's fault because they, they sort of <laughs> they sort of hung um, Rebecca out to dry there you know she there was this whole question of like is journalism activism and she, her answer was like very nuanced about how it can be because it raises people's voices and t stories can be told that couldn't be told before and they put the video like her face and then it's like you know journal journalism is activism and that's the headline that they put on it and then like that like you know the online community just like commented away, and it was it was really yeah. it was really unfair. And that's the other thing. I, like uh, I don't have very much love for TV, so sorry, but I don't have a lot of love for TV because <laughs> they're they're like these quick interviews, like sound bites, and they're always trying to like steer you, and you always have to like move the conversation back. And so there was a great opportunity to like ask her a follow up question because she said she thought that there were distinctions, and no one asked her. Well, what do you think those distinctions are between journalism and activism? They just journalism is act activism and they shoved it out to the internet and you know the result was pretty yeah. predictable so I, I think that was a really good lesson though too about like you know the professional media doesn't always get it right and and that was a great conversation that we had about how they got it wrong that time and why just but unfortunately I mean, Rebecca it, it was, was the receiving end I didn't of that. I, but the, the truth is though that that didn't like I mean obviously it sucked but like but I think that the the good thing was though that it started a conversation about journalism and about its place in America and that was what made me excited I actually I, I liked it like because it started a conversation and it made, got people thinking and there was articles um, about it and and like people were in this this era of of we were talking about activism and and, 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 and voices in America and and they brought it brought journalism into that into that question and it um, and it it made people think which I think is really good um, I think that's also the role of a journalist in some ways to make people think about their role in society and make people think about things that are going on around them. So in a way, I think that it, it was a good thing. I think that, um, back to your question about um, hate, I've, we, I've, we've all received um, threats and things from, from people on our, whether it be because of the Eagle Line, because they're connected to the school, or because of separate interviews. But I think what's important is not, is, is not focusing on that um, and I know that I'm sure that a lot of other journalists that are here have received threats because of the things that they've written. Um, and what's important is to not focus on that and, what's, and to focus on the opposite, the love that you get for what you write and people that message you and say, oh, I thank you so much for talking about the story. I feel like I feel like somebody else understands me, understands what I'm going through. Um, and I didn't know that anybody else felt like that. And you've just shown them that, they, that somebody else does. I could get like 11 hate messages and then I can go to a journalism convention and talk about new voices and then see that one student was impacted, you know, and they understand, oh my gosh, my voice does matter. Oh my gosh, I do self-censor. And that just made all the difference because you stopped so much from happening. You know, you they could have had exactly what happened at our school and several other schools happened if they weren't educated about that. And that in itself is so important. And that cool. was the hardest part for me was seeing my students hurt. It's and it's still going on even today. I mean, literally today at lunch. And that's the hardest part to sit by and see these kind of spirits crushed. But they've risen above it, and they inspire me every day. I think we'll end on that note. at Generators Conference. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Um, I think both of you for leading so many students over the years. And um, to Rebecca and Neha, uh, I think our future's in pretty good hands. Thank you. <laughs>
<clears throat> All right, so a couple of things. Um, we've heard about the Student Press Law Center um, uh, today, and I'm, I'm really happy to announce that they are starting a student impact incubator fund. And actually, Issue is going to be one of the founding partners uh, for that fund. And the, it's going to be launched in early 2019 to coincide with Student Press Freedom Day, which is on January 30th, 2019. Um, so this fund will support projects by high school and college student journalists, individually and newsrooms, which seek to deepen and sustain good journalism. The fund may support investigative efforts, initiatives to help improve school districts, media policies, all of which we're learning we need more of, to improve models for economic sustainability or other initiatives which will shine light on the important good work of student journalism. So um, we're, we're super proud as an organization to be supporting that. We'll, pro we'll be sharing more information uh, both about our participation and uh, the fund itself. If anyone wants more information, it's uh, splc.org. Uh, it's amazing work that, that they're doing and you can start to see the effects of how different organizations are also able to interact with you and, and help uh, provide you support and, and sustainability of, of what you're doing. We've worked with them for almost 20 weeks, guys. Like, they're the most impactful, helpful people. And, I mean, it's just so great to, it's, gr it's so great to know that professional journalism organizations support us, you know, and that's, that's where it starts, so. Awesome. Again, thank you. We have uh, just a little contribution from Issue to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas media efforts and to Prosper High School. We have to fill them out for you in a minute, but uh, there's, there are, <laughs> we have to, get to help us. Of that in the presentation. Uh, it's just a $500 <laughs> donations to, uh, to help support your, your journalism efforts. Thank you so much. And um, we appreciate you, everything you're doing. Like everybody's sort of stunned into silence. Thank There's you. They're both. They're, they're all going to be here at least for a little while. After after this session. <laughs> Audrey. I'm trying to get up. There's actually um, a flyer in your tote bags um, for SPLC. Um, so if you want more information, there are flyers in the tote bags. Um, we will be taking a short break. Um, we would like you back in your seats around 2:40. Our next and last panel of the day is actually going to be a rec recorded podcast. Uh, moderated by Grace Bonney of Design Sponge and Good Company with Tavi Gevinson from Rookie Mag, Jen Tolentino from Rock the Vote, and Nora Gomez-Strauss from Public Art Fund. So go ahead and enjoy some snacks and some drinks, and we'll see you back in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Question.